Hello, everyone. This is Coach Matt for the Seattle Chess School. And today, I would like to make a case for a defense against the fried liver attack known as the Traxler Gambit. The fried liver attack, of course, is after e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, knight f6, rather than bishop to c5. And then after knight to g5, making white commit to this attack, if that's what they so want to want to do, to defend this with the move bishop to c5. And of course, here we can see all the, the various moves that white can play after this. Now, it can be acknowledged that d5 is in fact black's best move in this position. And after e takes d5, knight to a5, and this, of course, um, after bishop to b5, leads to different positions where black will be down a pawn, but will have great peace activity. And I can acknowledge that this is black's uh, uh, best line and absolute best defense uh, to this. Uh, one of these days, I will make a case for b5 in this position, the Olvestad variation, which I believe is also playable for black and is also reasonably good. Um, today, however, we are going to go over something uh, that is a little bit more aggressive, and it is also sacrificial. Uh, Black will have to give up material in this line. Um, in this particular line, however, it'll be the white king that will be in equal amount of danger as the black king. So we will have some uh, fun to play with, uh, to play for. Um, in the form of white's king. You'll see many of these variations. Uh, well, no, they don't play king to e2, but we will see many variations where the white king will also uh, be a part of the proceedings. Now, before I get into some of the lines, I would actually like to mention uh, a few words about this move knight to g5. Most youngsters are taught this particular uh, attack because against other youngsters, this particular double attack on F7 uh, has proven over the years to be extremely hard to defend, especially for those that have never reached this position before. And the players who play this with white get used to the idea of putting their knight on g5, putting their bishop on c4, and expecting their opponents to blunder in this position, say something like h6, or queen to e7, or some you know, totally useless move like a5, or something like that. They get used to the idea of their opponent blundering, and then they get to uh, take on f7, either with the knight or the bishop, and have an extra pawn and... Uh, you know, some other extra advantages as well. Um, <clears throat> what I am suggesting here with the move Bishop C5 is that we actually take the fight right back to white. Uh, if they want to try to bully us and gang up on F7 and try to force us to find some way to defend it, I say that we play a move, especially with a little bit of study, that will uh, bring a lot of uh, tactics against the, uh, um, the white position and force this particular opponent to actually defend as well as, you know, being happy with the fact that they can actually take on F7, either with the knight or the bishop. So what we're trying to do here is fight our way out of this particular problem, just using simple good development, but with a, a, a few extra sacrifices thrown in. In a few of these lines, we will have to give up the H8 rook. This will be okay because we will actually get a large enough lead in development and chances to play for checkmate, as we shall see. Okay, now, when it comes to the theory in this position, there is only four tries that white can play here, and two of them are not particularly popular, but we could cover them very quickly. So the first one is, is uh, the first move that we will look at is if white does not take on F7, with either the knight or the bishop and uh, totally ignores it and just plays some useful move like castling. Any move that does not attack F7 is just simply going to be met by castling ourselves. And once we defend F7 with the rook, black has a model of coordination here, follow this up with either D6 or D5 or even H6 and uh, black will have completed development and have no particular weaknesses and no particular problems. And the fact that white has actually lunged 
twice forward with this knight and will be forced to go backwards means that white will have actually wasted uh, three tempi in order to achieve that. So uh, this uh, does not get, this variation does not give black any particular problems. It's the same thing if white were to develop a knight to say c3 or play pawn to d3 or, or play some other useful move. Anything that allows castling gives black a wonderful position to start off the game. So we do not have to worry about any uh, non-aggressive moves. Okay, so the first aggressive move that we shall look at that does require some uh, theoretical knowledge is the move d4. d4 attacks the bishop. It also allows uh, the bishop to defend the knight, which might be uh, nifty in some uh, ideas here. Uh, also, because the bishop is under attack and white still has this double attack here, there is still some threats to the position. So it turns out that the only way to get out of this is to play the move d5, which should give black equal chances, even though the position now looks like a big giant mess because everything is attacking everything and uh, uh, you know, we ha and I would assume that a lot of E4 players would not like this type of position after five moves, where instead of actually taking on F7, they get into a position where it turns out to be a, a big tactical mess right off the bat. And the opponent actually has uh, uh, good chances here. White does have four moves in this position. Uh, uh, five moves in this position, but none of them lead to any advantage. For example, if the bishop just simply backs off from the pawn attack, black can just take on d4 with the knight, and that gives black a nice advantage right off the bat. Um, again, we can, if we have time, we can castle, but the bishop on b3 is already going to be under attack, so we can, ex we can exchange this off. Uh, the white knight does not make any particular threat on f7 anymore, and black's position is already freed up. So this is not a big problem. If they play D takes E, then black simply needs to just capture the pawn with the knight, which attacks the bishop twice. It also incidentally defends F7. So there again is no more attack on this square. And again, black has no particular problems. If <clears throat> white actually captures the bishop, then, of course, we have to capture the bishop back, and this allows white to make a queen trade if they so wish, but this already is uh, a tad better for black, if not just completely equal, but we've achieved uh, uh, relatively easy equality in the first seven moves of the game, and I don't know of too, uh, of too many uh, true, true blue f um, fried liver players that would actually like to play this particular queenless middle game, but uh, this position also does not give black any particular problems. If white ends up taking on d5 with the pawn, then again, we will just simply play knight takes d4. And uh, this, again, does not give black any problems. If white plays c3, we can just simply back off with the knight and eventually perch it up on d6, which will, again, make black's position rather coordinated. If white tries to play d6 and go for a sneak attack on f7, once again, this is just simply met by castling. And once we can defend this with the rook, we do not have to worry about an exchange on f7, uh, <clears throat> even though it will be six points for six points, the bishop and knight are equal six, and the pawn and rook equals six, but that exchange favors black because black will actually have developed pieces and white will not. Okay, so the last move in this variation is if they take on d5 with the bishop, and this resumes the attack on f7. So, and it also has an attack on the bishop. So once again, we can play knight takes d4. And uh, whichever way the pawn is captured, we will actually have very similar counterplay as to other lines where black will get a large lead in development, but have to either give up material or give up castling. So for example, if bishop takes f7, uh, king takes e7, and this already threatens h6. So a lot of in these lines, when white captures on f7 with the bishop, then black will be threatening h6 on the next move, which will undermine the support. So the bishop always has to flee. And then after kicking the bishop and backing up, I would say this position is very similar to lines that we will uh, look at uh, later on where uh, black has a large lead in development and many active possibilities 
uh, pretty much all over the board. I mean, we have possibilities of playing h6. We can play rook f8. Queen to e8 is another move with a, a billiard shot to g6, which is a very nice square. We have opportunities to play bishop to g4 to disrupt uh, the proceedings and so forth. Okay, so, um, and then in this line, if white takes uh, f7 with the knight, this always forks the queen and the rook. And when the queen moves away to e7, then white wins the rook, which is maybe not to everyone's taste, but the fact that black has a number of uh, good looking pieces here uh, means that black actually has really reasonable counterplay. So for example, bishop to g4, already possibly threatening castles or uh, possibly capturing with uh, some sort of attack on the, uh, the king via queen h4, depending on how white defends. Um, like one sample line is if bishop to f7, check, which will misplace the king. But this, of course, also hits the queen on d1. So when the queen moves away, bishop to e2. And here, again, we can see that black has got a massive counterplay for the rook. Uh, one possible line is queen h3, bishop to g4, queen d3 here, making a draw. So this is, uh, and in fact, this is one of the uh, drawbacks to this particular line. Well, maybe it's, I guess it's a point of view drawbacks or perhaps an advantage where in some of these lines, uh, draws can be forced. And depending on your point of view, I mean, if you don't like draws, then this of course won't be a line for you. However, if you, uh, with the black pieces, if you like to make draws against strong opponents or uh, against scary openings, things like that, that proves that these, uh, these openings, uh, especially this one, the fried liver attack, can't be played as a winning weapon if draws can be forced. So, but this is just one, one little example here. Okay, uh, so that is from the D4 variation. So let's back up to this position. <clears throat> so more, much more popular is either capture on F7. So first we'll look at knight takes f7. This looks like the refutation of bishop to c5 because not only did white win a pawn, white is also forking queen and rook. So we're giving up a lot of material, so we should get something really good in return. What black has here is a very spectacular sacrifice in the form of bishop takes f2 check. So not only did we give away a pawn, we also are going to give away a rook, but we're also going to give away a bishop. And the point to this is to drag the white king out into outer space. And hopefully with this knight, this knight, this queen, this pawn, this bishop, uh, we can make mate with these pieces. Now, <clears throat> in this particular position, white has two ways to play. One is king f1. But what happens if white just simply accepts the gift with king f2? Now here, uh, we didn't give up this bishop for nothing. Of course, we, we will get a couple, we will get at least one pawn for it. We also get a couple checks for it, which means the white king now has to defend themselves. Now, in this position, white has six moves, but only two of them are any good. The good moves are either king to g1 or king to e3. But white has other choices. So let's take a look at the bad choices first. If king to f3, dragging the king out into outer space, black can actually throw away even more material here by playing queen to f6 check. Now this check is uh, extremely hard to deal with. Um, <clears throat> for example, if the uh, knight is refused, uh, well, like king g4 is totally suicidal, so we don't even have to look at that. I mean, uh, d5 should be more than good enough to win. But if the king refuses this by, say, going to either e3 or, e uh, or e2, then, of course, we now have a, a monstrous queen check. And I would say that queen to f4 is at least good enough uh, to chase the king around and we don't have to, I mean, a lot of the variations will look very similar to this. So uh, uh, this is practically unplayable already for white. So, uh, and actually any move that is played here is, is unplayable. Uh, the most uh, logical move would be to take more material with the king. And here black wins by playing d5 check first. So this allows the bishop to participate also in this attack. 
Um, and uh, so, for example, here, if white uh, takes, uh, king takes d5 and goes even further out into outer space, knight b4 is immediately winning. Uh, if king to e4, then queen f4 is checkmate. Uh, so the you know white king ate too many things there and got indigestion. And if queen to, or king to c5, then queen to b6 is checkmate. So this is a, will be a fun way to end the game. All right. So back up to here. So d5. Uh, after d5, if white plays bishop takes d5, which is the only other logical move. Then after queen f4 check, king to d3. Queen to d4. The reason why this move wins is that after king to e2, white will, black will just simply capture on d5 with the queen, and the threat of bishop to g4 or queen takes f7, or in some cases even castling, introducing the rook into the attack, uh, or in addition to all of this, uh, queen takes g2 check, uh, this gives black a winning attack. So king to f3 is the first move, that, and this one doesn't work. If the king goes straight back and goes to f1, instead of queen to f6 check, which actually allows queen to, if we go queen f6, it could play queen to f3. In this line, we play queen to h4, which uh, not only threatens checkmate, in some cases we're threatening knight to g3 check. Um, and... So these are the two threats. So uh, white can actually defend both with queen to e1, but we could play knight to g3 anyway. And if the queen captures on g3, then we have queen takes c4 check, uh, and then picking up the knight on f7, which will actually make it so that white's king is actually uh, way weaker uh, in that position. So here, because of that, uh, white can play h takes g, uh, kind of hoping that black will take the rook on h1. But instead, we take the bishop on c4 with check. And as we can see, the very next move will pick up the f7 knight. And in this position, black actually ends up a pawn with, uh, you know, slightly better development, but white's king will have some big problems uh, because it's floating around. So this also gives black an advantage. So king f1 cannot be played. Um, in this position, if king to e2, which is another bad move, this one actually allows the knight to jump in with check. So now we've got all kinds of uh, 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 fork potential with all these knights in the middle of the board. Uh, king d3 is a move uh, which already allows knight to, uh, to f2 check. However, the queen is also being attacked. So it turns out that black should play queen to h4, which threatens all kinds of different attacks, including knight to c5 check, knight f2 check. And so rook to f1 guards against the knight f2 check, d5. Now this, of course, hits the, uh, the bishop. And so the bishop must capture. And when knight c5 check happens, the king has to start floating around. Now king c3 actually loses to the very funny uh, knight to b5 mate. This is already checkmate since all the squares are, uh, are taken up. And if king to c4, uh, then black has a very nifty mate in four starting with b5 check. If the king captures on c5, then queen e7 is a very quick checkmate. So the, the slowest mate that white, the queen d4, and after queen, queen takes e2, queen d4 is checkmate. So another position where the king gets drug out into outer space and gets checkmated there. So knight c5. So the, uh, the only way to try to survive is king to e3. This allows bishop to g4 with a, a tempo on the queen, bishop f3 tries to guard against this, capture, capture, and now in order to start this really great attack, all uh, black has to do is castle short, which is kind of a funny move because now uh, it, it was actually legal for the rook to move through uh, the attack. And here the rook is, uh, the knight is now being attacked 
And this again gives black uh, an extremely good position. All right, so king to e2 is not playable. So f3 is not playable, f1 is not playable. This one's not playable on e2. King e1 is also not playable. This actually loses to the very simple queen h4 check. And uh, if the king comes out to e2, a very typical checkmating pattern in this line happens. Queen f2 check, king d3, knight c5 check, king c3, queen d4, check in mate. All the squares are covered. So the only other move in this position is g3, but this just loses to knight takes g3, and uh, white can basically resign here. Uh, there's a discovery on the on the bishop. There's an attack on the rook with check. Um, White's king is uh, totally devoid of defenders. This is already completely losing. So those four moves are out. Now, the two good moves in this position, one is king to g1. Now, this actually is good only from the point of view that White can force a draw in this position. And the, reason, and the way that they can do this is when black plays queen h4, the only good move, threatening queen f2 mate, g3, knight takes g3. Now, in this position, white can force a draw by simply grabbing the rook. Grabbing the knight does entail some risk in this position. So, for example, if white grabs the pawn, then we have queen takes g3 check, king to f1. And in any of these variations where we get time to play rook f8 and save our rook, we should do this. And suddenly this gives white something. Knight c3, queen f4 check, king to e1 uh, allows us to take the bishop. And even if white tries to save the knight with knight to g5, black has got full compensation here. Uh, for the piece. And uh, of course, we have a, a really weak king to play against. Okay, so uh, the best move here for white is to take the rook. Now, when this rook is captured, we should throw the other knight in. This will guard a couple of important squares. And now we've got uh, three, three pieces hanging around the king. So there might be you know, be some checkmating opportunities if white plays this wrong, but all white really has to do is capture the knight. And when this happens, we take the pawn, check, king f1, we play queen f4, check, and he cannot go to e2 anymore. And anywhere he goes, we just follow him, king g2, queen g5, and this is a perpetual check. Uh, if he goes back to f1, we go back to f4. If they go to f2, we go to f4, etc. and this makes a draw. Now, like I said before, this uh, could be considered a success. Uh, usually, if black can play an opening and force a draw within the opening, that's considered good for the black pieces since black is uh, uh, you know, a move down when the game starts. So if they can make a draw very early, that's considered uh, you know, quite a success. Now, of course, if you're playing black and you are much higher rated than your opponent, uh, then a draw might not be acceptable. And you could play one of the lines I suggested earlier with the classical D5. But <clears throat> um, if you're happy with diffusing this opening and proving that knight G5 is not a winning weapon, then here is a way where you can absolutely prove it. Okay, so king to G1 is a good move, but it leads to a draw. The best move, it quite possibly, is king to e3 so the king the king went from f2 to e3 and this looks really really dangerous for the white king however white is intending to actually grab on h8 and grab on e4 and try to hold on to all the material uh in this position we should play queen h4 and this is threatening either queen f4 or queen f2 and it could be guarded with g3 black again can sacrifice the knight with the discovery on the bishop and after white captures, black should throw in queen d4 check before uh, instead of taking the bishop. Uh, of course, queen takes c4 would be met by knight takes h8. So we have to keep up the pressure on the king. And um, so here is where we need to get some extra pieces to come out and bother this king. So we have the move d5. This threatens bishop g4 check winning the queen. It also threatens the bishop. 
The only way to guard all of this is to play the very nice looking move rook h4. And after e4 check, king to g2, white has a number of moves here, but most of these moves uh, basically end in some sort of uh, 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 draw. Like for example, after castles, which protects the rook and attacks the knight and attacks the bishop twice, um, white can play a move say like queen to h5 and after rook takes f7 bishop takes d5 black can actually make a draw here by going queen f2 check and no matter where the king goes black will just simply go back and forth from f1 to f2 and give check forever and ever which makes a draw so for example king h1 king h2 check 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 and draw so this also is a, a possibility, but again, if we can diffuse this opening by making draws, uh, this might be worth it. All right, so now the absolute main line, let's go back to the beginning, in this particular opening with bishop to c5 is not in fact knight takes f7, it is bishop takes f7. This is considered the best because uh, Basically, we have give, uh, we've won a pawn, and we are misplacing black's king. Now, when the king goes to e7, this is a very important moment. We should play king to e7, not king to f8, because we will actually need the f8 square for either the rook or the queen, depending on how uh, the game proceeds. So this, And because black is threatening h6, distracting the knight away from the bishop, the bishop must move. So white has two typical moves here. One is bishop to b3 the other is bishop to d5 like this which might uh okay and we can see by the highlight that basically what's the strategy that black is playing for is to try to put the rook on f8 the queen on e8 so again you can uh, come out to the g6 square and to play d6 and uh i should also have thrown in h6 we want we want to throw in these four moves in some particular order uh so, for example, if, um, you know, we could play a move like rook to f8, castles, and in this position, we could play a move like d6, we could play h6, that's probably the most accurate move, and then follow it up with queen to e8, followed by d6, and this is a gambit position where black will be down upon seven, uh, white can castle, Black can play d6, which releases the light square bishop and, um, you know, threatens to put something on the g4 square in some cases, like, for example, c3, bishop g4. And when white backs up uh, to f3, uh, the computers consider this to be slightly better for white. However, I think this is reasonable compensation for a pawn. Uh, like I said, black will uh, try to play, you know, something like queen to e8 to g6 to have the queen participating in a king side attack. Uh, that will also allow the king to wander back over to the queen side if need be. And even though, like I said, the computers might not like this, I think this is reasonable compensation. And anybody who has got uh, some good attacking uh, abilities could make use of Black's development here, in my opinion. Um, which leaves bishop to b3, which is considered the main move. So after bishop to b3, again, we have uh, the same sort of strategy. Uh, queen can go to e8 or f8. Uh, the rook can go to f8. The pawn goes to d6. The, knight can, the pawn can go to h6 as well to kick the knight backwards. Um, now, in this position, I have a particular... Uh, liking for the move queen to f8, which might not be to everyone's taste because this, of course, does block in the rook and it prevents the rook from going to the best square. And also it takes some time for the queen to get to anywhere useful like the g6 square. However, the one thing I do like about queen to f8 is that is it is the only move that blocks out d3. d3 is a major resource for white in these positions because it allows the bishop to go to e3 to knock out the dark square bishop's influence. And this position, and in this position, d3 is not playable because of the move bishop takes f2. We will take a look at this in the games portion uh, video, which I will uh, do next. This is just simply the theory portion. So those are the four moves in this position. 
bishop c5. Uh, so the four moves are castles, d4, knight takes f7, and bishop takes f7. And all of these moves, I think, can be met adequately. And this hopefully will give you guys uh, some a useful weapon against these the fried liver players. My intention with this video, by the way, is to eventually make it so that this move is not playable unless white wants a draw. If white wants to be known as a draw master, then they play knight to g5. In my, in my opinion, the only good move in this, in this position in the two knights defense is d3. No other move is good enough. Um, so I know some people like to play D4 and some people like to play the fried liver, of course, but both of those moves are not nearly as good as D3. And hopefully that will be the future of this position as it was the past, uh, as it is the present. Many of the uh, top flight grandmasters are all playing D3 in this kind of position. Um, and I'm hoping that, uh, all of us at the um, mortal level will also start playing D3 instead of knight to G5. One last little challenge for all of you that like to play this type of thing with the white pieces. Um, when, when one plays knight to G5, the intention is to take advantage of bad play. Nobody plays knight to G5 and expects their opponent to play well in this position. They expect a, a, a very easy victory, which means a lot of times this type of a, opening works against weaker players that are weaker than yourself, lower rated than yourself, less experienced than yourself. My challenge to you, to for the, all of you that like to play the fried liver with the white pieces against players that are weaker than yourself, is that once, whenever you play e4, e5, if you're if you feel like that you're playing somebody that does not have as much experience as you, I challenge you to play the king's gambit against those players. At the very least, you will learn something with each particular game instead of actually just having a position where you win in the exact same way every single time f4 leads to a whole variety of adventures and you'll get to practice different aspects of chess such as center control uh, what to do when you have the initiative what do you do when you have a lead in development you also get a lot more end games in this type of opening so you get to practice that so if you're playing someone that is much weaker than yourself i challenge you to play the king's gambit against such players instead of the fried liver attack. Anyway, we shall end it with that. So this has been Coach Matt for the Seattle Chess School, and I shall see you guys on the next one.